cool. Um, well, the first thing, once again, thanks for like inviting me to talk. Um, the first thing that I was thinking about um, when you sent me the topic of radical queer theory or queer theory in general, um, the first thing I kind of settled on was the broadness of the topic. Right. Um, as with any kind of, I guess, uh, theoretical approach or praxis, um, it changes depending on, you know, who's employing it, right, or who's talking about it. Um, and that's a lot of what I've observed in my own experience and then a lot of what um, I read about uh, different people add their own experience and so it kind of changes. Um, but it's always important for me to start with some kind of definition to go off of. Um, and so a working definition that I have for queer theory is uh, a theoretical practice, praxis or method of interrogation uh, that seeks to understand and develop a strategy for liberation using specific uh, points of entry, right? Um, or for specific intersections, uh, interrogations of intersections. So race, class, uh, gender. Um, and it, it looks at these things or questions uh, power structures in our society using these lenses, right? Um, and so, I think the, the thrust of it usually is liberation um, from a kind of oppression. Uh, and liberation can take different forms, like material liberation, right? When we're talking about uh, queers not being uh, boxed out of certain rights or privileges that societies give, uh, spiritual liberation, when we talk about people um, finding greater autonomy within themselves. Um, or the ability just to exist. Um, yeah, um, and so what I want to do uh, is look at four examples um, or four kind of starting points for me at least um, when I think about uh, radical queer theory. Um, and one of them, well, the first one that I usually go to um, is the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and the, there was a collective of artists in the Harlem Renaissance called the, the Niggerati. Um, and it was made up of some of the bigger people in it were Lauren, uh, not Lauren, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, um, Richard Bruce Nugent, and Wallace Thurman. Uh, and they formed this collective of younger artists uh, within the Harlem Renaissance. And one of their points um, was to talk about the dangers of assimilation for Black people in particular um, in the United States in that particular time period. A lot of uh, what they observed was a presentation of Blackness that was uh, digestible for white people, right? Um, and so what a lot of their arguing was in this, uh, in this quest to assimilate or present things that will sell, um, that are digestible, we lose a lot of the richness of our own culture, right? Um, Zona Hurston is a perfect example uh, with the way, she's, the way that she wrote, right? Because she did a lot of anthropological work um, and she wrote in quote unquote black English. Um, and that was her point uh, to write in the way that it was most authentic to the people that she was portraying or studying. Uh, and a lot of times that didn't translate to um, book sales right uh yeah, she was even an anthropologist right like she was exactly really working as an anthropologist yeah. but she root she stayed center she centered herself in her community and her work right. um which and she got a lot of pushback from like the you know these different institutions because and people but these communities mm -hmm. because anthropology is like rooted in um the other and like seeing it from a white lens so yeah her work was really uh powerful and um, trailblazing in that way. Right, right. She, they, or they released a collection of uh, her work called Barracoon, Barracoon a few years ago. Did you read that? No, not yet. It's good, it's good. It's like a 100 page book and it's the, um, it is the, it's an interview with the last uh, person who was transported to this country through the, uh, the slave trade. Right. Right, so she tracked down this person who she believed to be the last person transported 
um, and she just interviews him. It's a really good book. Oh. Um, so the Nicarati, uh created a pamphlet called Fire, um, which was, uh, I think, universally like panned even by W.E.B. Du Bois um, in that time period. Uh, and one of the things in their manifesto that they talk about is this concept of vulgarity. Mm -hmm. um, and they're talking about vulgarity in language um, and vulgarity in subject matter. Um, because other members of the collective, like Richard Bruce Nugent, for instance, were uh, very committed to talking about homosexuality and sex work. Um, <clears throat> And so a lot of the pushback, of course, was along the lines of respectability. And so they're challenging this notion of um, when uh, labeling things vulgar, this notion um, that we need to present our best uh, selves in order to be respected and what that does to us spiritually, because a lot of what they were saying is that we lose um, any connection or ability just to live in our authentic self by watering that down um so i always think that when i when i was thinking about when you um mentioned the topic they were the first people that i thought of um the second group of people that i thought of uh were the kambahi river collective um which was a group uh that existed i think between 74 and 80 1974 80 um specifically labeling themselves uh, as black feminists Black lesbian feminists. Um, and I want to read some quotes from their statement, which is what they're most known for is the Kambahi River Collective statement. Um, and the first thing that they say in their opening is, it was our experience and disillusionment with these liberation movements. And they're talking about um, being involved with the Black Panthers, with the Civil Rights Movement, with the uh, Black Liberation Movement. Um, it was our experience and disillusionment within these liberation movements, as well as experience on the periphery of, white, of the white male left that led to the need to develop a politic that was anti-racist, unlike those of white women and anti-sexist, unlike those of black and white men, right? Um, and so this, for me, what they're speaking to is this identity of a mar this marginalized identity, right? So you go um, towards one uh, kind of liberation movement and you find that there's kind of a hegemony um, there, right? Um, of male power, right? And then you go towards another one uh, and they're talking about feminism in that time period and you find that uh, a lot of the issues are specifically addressing white women. Right, and so there's still this, um, even in these liberatory movements, there still is a narrow focus. Um, and so that's why they kind of formed. Uh, they said, there is also undeniable, there's also undeniably a personal genesis for black feminism. That is the political realization that comes from the seemingly personal experiences of black women's lives. Black feminists and many more black women do not define themselves as feminists um, and have all experienced a kind of sexual oppression as a constant factor in our day-to-day -day existence. As children, we realized that we were different from boys and that we were treated differently. For example, we were told in the same breath both to be quiet for the sake of being ladylike and to make us less objectable in the eyes of white people. As we grew older, we became aware of the threat of physical and sexual abuse by men. However, we had no way of conceptualizing what was so apparent to us. We knew what was really happening. Um, the focus, the, this focusing upon our own oppression is embodied in the concept of identity politics. We believe the most profound and potentially most radical politics come directly out of our own identity, as opposed to working to somebody else's working to end somebody else's oppression. Um, and so when we talk about the importance, I think, of queer theory, right? Because that's always something that's why is this necessary? Um, like with any other kind of uh, field of study that sits in marginalized identity, I think 
um, what I'm hearing from them and what I hear uh, when I read and reflect is the power of understanding the society or seeing the society from a position that is not always privileged to, to speak or that's not always given voice. Um, and the ability of people within those groups to see uh, certain violence that is not seen by those who are privileged. Um, you know, uh, and so I think that it's absolutely um, important um, to look at to look at things in these lenses because we are hearing where there are gaps or pitfalls, right? We we are losing a large um, majority of the population, right? Um, and I think something that the Kambahi River Collective um, later hits on too is what damage it does to the larger society. These um, things that we accept as normal. Um, we believe, this is another quote, we believe that sexual politics under patriarchy is, we believe that sexual politics under patriarchy is as pervasive in Black women's lives as are the politics of class and race. We also often find it difficult to separate race from class and from sexual oppression because in our lives, they are most often experienced simultaneously. We know that there is such a thing as racial sexual oppression, which is neither solely racial nor solely sexual, i.e. the history of rape of black women by white men is a weapon of political repression. Um, and so the, the connection I think um, that's being made between um, something that is oftentimes um, not viewed as a, as political, um, sexual assault, uh, and the way that that violence is being tied into the violence of the, the structure, the power structure, um, as being something that is necessitated by the structure. Um, I think we find those connections, uh, in feminism and in queer theory, right? Um, I'm also reminded of, there was a clip um and i don't know did you do you remember there were two men in malawi who were who got married they had a traditional marriage to each other no okay so there were there's a clip um of two men in malawi who um were married to each other and there was a lot of hoopla um about it and one of the things that i always thought was most potent or poignant um is one of the protesters uh countered um someone who was arguing that it was uh illegal by saying well these are all colonial laws right um <clears throat> and i think that's an important thing to look at right the connection between um how uh, gendered violence or or sexual violence is connected to this history of colonialism in our world right um and how these things were kind of necessitated, colonialism necessitated these things yeah. in order to function. Um, uh, black feminists often talk about feelings of craziness before becoming conscious of concepts of sexual, uh, sexual politics, patriarchal rule, and most importantly, feminism. The political analysis and practice that we women use to struggle against our oppression. The fact that racial politics and indeed racism are pervasive factors in our lives do not allow us and still do not allow most black women to look more deeply into their own experience from the sharing and growing consciousness to build politics that will change our lives and, and inevitably end oppression. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think that there's a, I can't think of who, Injustice somewhere, injustice anywhere is injustice everywhere, right, Martin Luther King? Um, and to take that one step further, um, a lack of interrogation of what we are building in mm -hmm. any part of our movement mm -hmm. um, is, is a blind spot for our entire movement, right? Um, Fred Hampton, one of the uh, Black Panthers from Chicago, often said, I don't want to 
replace capitalism with uh, black capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. We'll have a whole bunch of Negro imperialists. Um, <clears throat> and so the, the importance, once again, the importance of kind of using these lenses um, is to uproot, right? Radical, uproot everything and to question everything. Mm -hmm. um, we realize that the liberation of all oppressed people necessitates the destruction of political economic systems of capitalism and imperialism as well as patriarchy right? because patriarchy and imperialism um, necessitate this violence against queers and women, um, the subjugation of them. Um, a lot of queer theory too often will uh, speak to a connection to um, white leftists like Marx. Right. Uh, it'll it also denounce it, it at a certain point, but it will speak to um, a connection to it, right? The importance of looking at class as a part of our analysis. Mm -hmm. um, something that I do appreciate about uh, Marx and his theories of alienation is he talked about um, the alienation of people um, as spiritual beings, you can extrapolate this. He talked about the alienation of people as spiritual beings under capitalism, right? Um, when we are in a position where we're coerced to give, give away our labor, mm -hmm. right, go to work um, for something that we do not reap any direct benefit from, um, and then we come home uh, and we sit for whatever period of time, and then we get up and go to work again, and this is the, like, is the routine of our lives, then what does that do to our uh, relationship to each other, right? Um, what distance does that put between me and another person um, when the, my primary concern really is uh, being quote unquote productive, right. um, you know? And then uh, he talks about the fetishism of commodities and our, our uh, our need to kind of escape uh, the violence of our lives through purchase or through um, acquiring things that we're told to make us, that will make us feel better. Mm -hmm. um, and so a lot of queer theory will nod at this stuff, right? It'll look at this and say, well, this is true, um, but it's also incomplete because we're not um, talking about the other things that are beneath it, right? The pillars of it. Um, and so the Kambahi River Collective Statement, I think, uh, speaks to that trickle-down violence. Um, they talk about patriarchy as being something that's necessary for capitalism to exist. Um, and so when we look at the experiences of Black women who go out um, and have had to not only face the violence of racism, but have also had to face the... or face the violence and mediate the violence of uh, black men um, who are struggling with their own oppression. And then um, that kind of snowball, that, snow, that avalanche of violence down to them um, is something that they're talking about. And I think this is really important. Um, something that we're about to get to, um, I think too, is the, the danger and assimilation. Um, so the third group um, that I looked at was the STAR organization. Um, and the language is really outdated. Um, so I apologize to any of your students if this is offensive. The STAR stood for Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries. <clears throat> um, it was started by Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera mm. um, in New York. Um, so a little history Marsha P. Johnson was a trans black trans woman um, she's credited her and Sylvia Rivera are credited as being two people who uh, were present at Stonewall um, and influential in it they also went on um, to found an organization called STAR uh, and the aim of STAR was to uh, help to house and protect uh, sex workers and uh, young trans people of color um, they also were trying to organize them around certain political points. Um, there isn't that much information about them. And sadly, Sylvia Rivera 
lived longer, but Marshall B. Johnson was killed um, very short, short after, shortly after, like the formation. Um, but yeah, so the the Star Organization, uh, one of the most uh, visible things that they did was in uh, 1973, I think, at Gay Pride, when Sylvia Rivera um, gets on stage in this fierce jumpsuit. She gets on stage, um, and she starts to lay into the participants of Gay Pride, right? Um, and one of the things that she talks about is uh, that Star was receiving an overwhelming number of letters from prisoners who were trans, um, and who were queer, and <clears throat> she talks about how this is a population that has been abandoned mm -hmm. um, by the community, um, and she talks about the kind of the price of assimilation. What happens when our thrust for uh, equality um, <clears throat> or civil rights when those things are limited only to the most acceptable um, populate the segment of our populations, right? And so in this case, we're talking about gay men and then we're talking specifically um, white gay men, mm -hmm. right? Um, so what happens is we don't talk about how trans women um, uh, are boxed out of employment, um, especially if they don't quote unquote pass. Um, we don't talk about uh, laws of criminality around um, being trans and being a sex worker or um, being a black queer um, and the ways in which uh, a certain behavior uh, is necessary for survival, right? I'm talking about stealing, um, manipulation, those things um, become necessary methods of survival that are punished more harshly by the power structure. Um, we don't talk about these things um, because what we end up talking about is uh, this really thin narrative of uh, don't oppress me because I, I'm just as human as you are, right? Um, <clears throat> and so she goes on, she goes on, a, um, she goes on a, I think it's about five minutes, five minutes speech. She had to argue to get she on She goes stage. in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, a yeah, good video. Yeah. I've seen it. Yeah. She goes, right. She tells them. Exactly. To their face. Beyond, yeah. No chaser. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something to, uh, and this is the danger, I think, in our movements, not, um, or in our theory, not looking um, at these critiques as valid because this is something that we're still talking about now, mm -hmm. right? Um, we still are talking about uh, the importance of hearing trans women speak, in particular, black trans women. Right. We still are talking about what are the dangers of um, these single issue movements like gay marriage and right. stuff like that. Like the military. Exactly. Marriage, that's just kind of like just, Gay rights is, has just been boxed into those things in the dominant narrative, but it's there's mm -hmm. so much beyond just those things, you know. And there's even, right. you know, like even, you know, thinking about the military and how it's, you know, an extension or it is the empire. It's like the tool of empire, especially global empire. And right. so, like complicating that 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 analysis, like, okay, you might have the right to be in the military but what does that even mean in terms of right. like, the larger community and the larger world uh that we want to see right right what does it mean to, to argue for citizenship when you are a citizen yeah. of a violent colonial power right. you know um and yeah i think that it's, it's just an examination of privilege mm -hmm. that's what it's arguing for is this, this constant examination of where our privileges are um, and where our blind spots are. Um, yeah. there's, there's an anthology called Against Equality. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it came out in 2012. And it came out around the same time that the Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. Um, and it was arguing against uh, just blanket celebration of gays being able to serve in the military. Right. right. 
you know, what does it mean um, to celebrate that we can now go kill people of color abroad for resources? Right. You know, is this liberation, right? Is this um, a point of celebration? Um, and there's a person, there's a group in the Bay Area, or they still exist, um, but they were more robust um, probably a decade ago called Gay Shame. Okay. It was started by uh, a queer named Matilda Bernstein. Um, but their, uh, a lot of their activism was centered, and I, Matilda and Gay Shame are like the last people that I thought of right here. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of their stuff was centered around critiquing kind of this, um, this gay citizen identity, right? This gay citizen of the United States identity. And what does that, what does that mean um, to argue for citizenship? Um, and the ways in which, one of the things that they talked about too is um, a lot of the rhetoric around um, gay marriage um, and uh, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was centered in citizenship, right? Because we deserve to have the right to be citizens. Um, and not, um, and it was, it was, it was based kind of in that, and that was a stopping point. There was no interrogation or, or thought behind what, um, does it mean to be a citizen of the United States when the United States is bombing, um, other countries? What does it mean to be a citizen of the United States when the United States has the, the largest prison population in the world? Um. And the majority, of a strong uh, a majority of that prison population is black and brown people. Mm -hmm. um, what does it mean to be a citizen of a country um, when uh, prisons um, and shelters and healthcare are not safe places for trans people to be? Um, uh, and so I think I'm going to read a little bit of what, because Matilda kind of goes off and I don't want to read all of Matilda, but um, so there was an incident in the Castro um, in 1998 where uh, there was a proposal by the city to build a youth shelter there, and a lot of the Castro residents um, at that point argued against the building of the youth shelter because they said it would bring the property value down mm. by having these homeless youth now in the Castro. Um, and we can we can infer um, when we look at rates of homelessness that we are also talking about more people of color in the Castro because the Castro is pretty affluent when you talk about the folks that live there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, we can also infer that that also would, that that was coding for more trans people in the Castro. You know, all these things. Um, and so one of the comments that Matilda. May was what is sad about the Castro and similar gay neighborhoods across the country and across the world, and what is indicative um, and indicative of what gay people do with even a little power is that these same smiling gay men have failed to build community for queers or anyone outside of their social groups. Many gay men, even in the Castro, still remain on the fringes either by choice or lack of opportunity. Um, sorry, I just clicked something. Okay, by or lack of opportunity, but as the most successful gays have moved from outsider status to insider clout, they have consistently fought misogynist, racist, and classist ages battles to ensure that their neighborhoods remain communities only for rich male and white people. Uh, they've succeeded in clapping down on the anger, defiance, flamboyance, and subversion once thriving in queer subcultures in order to promote vapid, consume or die, only whites need apply, gay identity. Homo now stands for homogene homogeneous, um, more for homogeneous than any other type of sexuality aside from bye, bye, bye. So Matilda, um, Matilda talks a lot about um the richness in uh what 
used to be a lot of uh, the richness in uh, gay subcultures, right? Mm. Um, and the valid, uh, the validity of these subcultures. And the Matilda argues against um, lionizing these movements for uh, equality because oftentimes, like we said before, their movements uh, where the thrust is centered in a, in a lack of belief, right? The thrust is centered in um, don't uh, please don't oppress me because I look like you or please don't oppress me because it's something that I can't change, right? And kind of likening that in a way, likening uh, your queerness in a way to mm -hmm. a, a disease, right? Mm -hmm. I was born with this, so I can't change it. Um, so please don't attack me, right? And what we do, um, what Matilda is positing that we do in those um, spaces is that we also uh, simultaneously cut out anything that would be considered vulgar or, or um, uh, what's it? Ooh, the words escaping me, that would be considered um, unsavory for uh, the people that we're appealing to, right? And so there's kind of this echo that we see um, between what Matilda is saying with what um, the Sylvia Rivera and Marsha B. Johnson were saying, with the Black feminists and the Kambahi River Collective were saying, and even with the people um, in the Harlem Renaissance were saying is that we lose um, this large group of people when we don't look at these spaces. Um, when we don't look at these subcultures as valid um, things that need to be protected um, and even things that need to be pushed to the forefront of our analysis. Um, and then what that ripple effect is, well, all of these people are uh, historically based in the United States, right? So then the ripple effect um, of that um, is that we reinforce the empire right. of the United States. States, right? right? We reinforce um, what is a, a violent colonial and global culture. Um, oh, I got you. Okay. I got you. Okay. Um, so, one sign of power, this is Matilda, one sign of okay. power. And then just to let you know, Jamal, we got about four more minutes, I think, before it might cut us off. I'm not really oh, sure. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, we can, Matilda's just going off about the same stuff. Okay. So, um, Matilda's just going off about the same stuff, just with different examples. Um, but those are things that I thought uh, were most important, kind of like starting points yeah. um, for that discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. So I heard like a lot of like also decolonialism, decolonizing ourselves and like the ideas of who we're supposed to be and just kind of being liberated and like centering that in, you know, uh, just being in the world and moving forward in that way. Um, mm -hmm. And also the importance of like, yeah, like identity, like really standing in your identity, whatever that may be, and um, allowing that to be like your norm and a norm that mm -hmm. you accept, right? And yeah. I, um, and then I don't know if you had any like last points that you wanted to make, but one question I really wanted to ask you, mm -hmm. like what do you envision for the future? Like real possibilities for mm -hmm. a future that's different than, uh, than the one we, the present that we live in now? Or what, yeah. you know, how do you see a decolonized or liberated society or world? Mm-hmm. Um, I think one of the most important things for me is always autonomous community um, and building uh, spaces outside of um, the government and nonprofits um, that are run by, uh, run by and have these conversations, right? That are run by folks who are in the margins and have these conversations. Um, I think there are limitations in what we can do um, with uh state sponsored space right um, so i think funding and developing um and nurturing these kind of free spaces is always the most important thing to me mm -hmm. um yeah all right beautiful thank you <laughs> thank you